the shooting range. In this episode, the long-nosed butcher bird, the fuck wolf 190D13, the wonders of live.worthhunter.com, a new selection of fantastic user-made skins, hotline, the developer sends her questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with the Sherman question. What changed for the Sherman when it got a new stabilizer? Before the new stabilization system arrived, Sherman tanks, though they're decent machines overall, had one big flaw. They didn't perform that well when you needed to quickly advance the attack. You had to stop to make an accurate shot, and then the gun stayed wobbly for quite some time, which was hardly ideal given that this tank can boast having impenetrable armor. As a result, aggressive pushes were a risky move. So, what changed? The vehicle got a single-plane stabilization system, and now it's a different kind of beast. When it's driving at a speed of under 15 km an hour, the gun can easily be locked on target regardless of the type of terrain you're currently traversing. You can now freely move through the most dangerous parts of the map. Just keep an eye and the gun on the poplar spots and the avenues of approach and be ready to open fire. Most opponents will not expect to get a shell the same moment they see you. If you take into account the relatively small time that the Sherman's' guns take to reload, you'll see that now you can push very aggressively, getting rid of your enemies on the go and without bleeding much speed. This tactic works best with early low-tier Shermans and the Jumbo, as you can reap the benefits of stabilization while using cruise control in first gear. The versions with a 76mm gun are trickier to handle. They're simply too fast for the stabilization system to work properly. Yeah, we know. But there's a workaround. Just turn off the cruise control the very moment you see an enemy. You'll have him or her firmly in your sights in a second. This new trait allows you to aim at the most vulnerable spots of your enemies and deal a lot of damage on the go without wasting much time hiding behind cover. That makes Sherman's a viable pick for all players who enjoy aggressive pushes. Just don't make the mistake of thinking that a new stabilizer turned this tank into some kind of an unstoppable juggernaut, because it didn't. Be careful, vigilant, and keep your powder dry. What do you do if you suddenly realize that the enemies are at your doorstep and you have no effective weapon to use against them? Well, you build the long nose door, apparently. Tank was saying that the Luftwaffe would soon need engines built for high-altitude performance as early as in 1941, but nobody listened. That's hardly surprising. At that time, the armies of the Third Reich still reigned supreme, but the change was already in the wind. The Focke-Wulf 190 was an excellent machine, but Allied pilots eventually learned how to deal with it. Furthermore, they started to fly new aircraft outfitted with powerful, high-altitude engines. These new adversaries soon proved to be more than the Focke-Wulf 190 could chew. At 7,000 meters above the ground, the German engines were already in trouble, but for lightnings and thunderbolts, that was just the beginning. And that was not all. The British launched a massive bombing campaign against military objectives in German towns, and soon the British bombers were joined by the American B-17s. Those could go on bombing runs in broad daylight. Four turbo superchargers allowed them to operate at extremely high altitudes, where the German planes were crippled. And the bombers of the Allies didn't come alone. They were protected by lightnings and thunderbolts, and the fearsome P-51D Mustang was already on its way. Finally aware of the gravity of the situation, the bosses of the Luftwaffe demanded that the engineers find a new way to counter the Allied aircraft as soon as possible. The German engine designers turned out to be more far-sighted than their superiors. They never stopped making designs for engines built for high-altitude performance and thus had quite a few things to show right off the bat. Of course, the best possible scenario would be to equip the Focke Wolf 190 with a large 18-cylinder radial aircraft engine. But the Americans were no fools and bombed the heck out of BMW factories, so an excellent BMW 802 was a no-go. There was only one other viable option, to use a 12-cylinder liquid-cooled engine. The Daimler-Benz DB603 was still being worked on, 
But then there was the promising Junkers Jumo 213E that could already be used. It maintained the 35-liter displacement, but the German engineers added a pressurized cooling system and introduced a number of improvements that allowed it to run at a high RPMs. All of that required a special kind of fuel laced with tetraethyl and a water methanol injection system, later a nitrous oxide system. The engine also had to be given thorough maintenance after just a couple of flights, but that was well worth it. Throw in a two-stage supercharger and you get a great high-altitude engine. The only thing left to do was to actually build an aircraft that could use it. That's when the Focke-Wulf 190 and its creator showed what they were both capable of. The almost modular design of the aircraft allowed the engineers to basically reinvent the plane in a matter of weeks. For instance, in order to fit the UMO 213 in the fuselage while maintaining balance, both the nose and the tail of the aircraft had to be lengthened. Quite a radical change, don't you think? Strangely enough, all of that worked, and at the start of 1943, the Germans had a final prototype of a new interceptor. Moreover, the aircraft was designed in such a way that it was possible to use the existing FW-190A or the FW-190F to build a new plane instead of building one from scratch. At first, the pilots were less than enthusiastic about the new fighter. A lot of them thought that the UMO 213 engine was better suited for a bomber, but soon even the most skeptical ones were converted. The aircraft was climbing almost too fast, it could maneuver and dive as well as the early Focke-Wulf 190, and most importantly, it was capable of downing any aircraft it faced, including the latest Allied types. The Allied bombers made sure that the Germans could never truly produce this plane in mass, and the Focke-Wulf 190D were never made in great numbers. But despite all that, it didn't take a lot of time for the long-nosed Dora to develop a fearsome reputation. But for Kurt Tank, this fighter was just a stopgap until a much more promising aircraft arrived. He was already working on the TA-152, but that's a story for another time. Kurt Tank wasn't the only one who made planes. A lot of our players do that as well. Those are made of pixels, not steel, but they're great nevertheless. Do you remember the time when we showed a fantastic futuristic stealth camouflage in one of our previous episodes? That was just the beginning. The user called George136 had made a stealthy version of the mighty Spitfire. It is now almost invisible to human eye. The aircraft takes the color of any surface which is behind it. All that thanks to a deflecting layer of shiny hexagons that covers the plane from tail to nose. The author helpfully points out that the effect is achieved by using blotches of isotope Rungen RG281 and RG282. Okay. User Rulo6000 opted to work on a much more modern aircraft. This is a copy of Ms. Demeter, the Hawker Hunter F-1 piloted by Jonathan Flapjack Whaley. The pilot has been using this particular aircraft to perform at various air shows in the UK, Europe and Abu Dhabi for the last 15 years. Well, this camouflage has a striking resemblance to the real thing. Bloody well done! And finally, there's this, a great camouflage by the player called Wax. That has nothing to do with the real world. Simply put, Wax created a steampunk version of the SM-79 Sparviero. Copper colored fuselage, gears, rivets, and a set of thematic decorations. The result is nothing short of glorious. One last thing, you are free to download all these camels and use them in game. Isn't that great? Keep up the good work, folks. Now it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first message comes from a player called KG Arbin. Hey Gaijin, I play Russian planes primarily and I was wondering if you're going to add more maps to our rotation. I've learned all of the maps the Russians see nearly like the back of my hand and I'm only a ranked tank player. Hey mate, yeah, most likely, we have people who are currently working on new exciting maps all the time. 
A player called AWC asks, Will the replay system ever be refined or improved? It's kind of hard to get some camera angles and some views are not included in the instructions. And there are bugs that sometimes happen in the replay. Yeah, definitely. We and our players are not 100% happy with the current system, so we'll keep digging. Then there's a message from Cowboy Commando 54 Still waiting on ground assault. Yeah, we are making it. Don't want it to be a flop, do you? Please wait for a little while. Last question comes from a user with an unexpected Russian nickname. Tavarishi Angeli writes, Question, when will the War Thunder League return? Feedback, the Q&A section of those videos should be longer. Answer, soon. And thanks for the feedback, it's always appreciated. As we've said before, we'd like to answer more questions, but the answers come from the actual people who work on the game. And these guys and girls aren't easy to question. Hmm, we should probably set up an interrogation room or something. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the shooting range.